Our guest this week on Veterans Chronicles is U.S. Army veteran and Korean War veteran and Vietnam War veteran Paul Roach. And sir, thank you very much for being with us. Thank you for being here. We're joining uh, you here at the American Veterans Center Conference in 2017 in Washington, D.C. Uh, let's start with your story. Where were you born and raised? I was born in Las Cruces, New Mexico, uh, about 90 years ago, and uh, grew up there, went to high school, and uh, as soon as I got out of high school, uh, I registered for the draft in 1945 and uh, got drafted right away. And eight days later, the uh, Japanese found out that I'd been drafted, so they uh, quit. And then uh, I spent about 10 months in the Army, and I had an appointment to the military academy. Went to West Point in uh, 1946, graduated in uh, 1950 class of 1950. What was the most significant part of that experience for you? Well, just getting through West Point, <laughs> especially plebe year at West Point. Uh -huh. What was the toughest part about it? Well, I think the toughest part was, uh, as I said, plebe year. They give the plebes a pretty rough time. But after that was over, uh, uh, Things were switched around, so I had the opportunity to give the plebes, uh, <laughs> the new plebes, uh, time. Did you have the instinct to go easy on them because they were tough on you, or did you relish the chance to dish it out on them? Well, I was, uh, I was not a very tough uh, upperclassman, but uh, I was required to give them a little hard time. Now, we spoke with one of your uh, colleagues, um, Colonel Dow, Dow uh, a little bit earlier. Did you know him at West Point? Yes, I knew knew him. We weren't uh, very close, but I knew him. Okay. And, and he was saying that, of course, he was in the same class as you, 1950. He was immediately deployed to Korea after that, uh, after commencement. So was that the same for you? Yes, it was. Mm -hmm. And what unit were you assigned I to? I was assigned to the 9th Infantry Regiment of uh, 2nd Infantry Division which was already in Korea, uh, fighting. When did you join them? In uh, August, late August of 1950. Okay. And so they were, was the push north yeah. already happening at that point? No, we were still in the uh, Pusan perimeter. And uh, we st spent about another month there and then uh, crossed the Naktong River and uh, the day that we crossed the Naktong River, I was, uh, our convoy got ambushed, and I was trying to find out what was going on, and I got shot in the leg. So at that time, they evacuated me back to Japan, spent about a month there uh, in the hospital and recuperating, and then came back to Korea. You probably wish it had been a couple extra months in the hospital. Yes, it if out. it had been about uh, 10 days later, I, <laughs> my life would have been changed quite a bit. Wow. Okay, so where was your unit when you rejoined it after being in Japan? It was uh, up in the northern part of North Korea, about uh, 40 miles from the uh, Chinese border, I guess. And I joined an another company there. And I was with them for about eight days before the uh, the Chinese really came into North Korea. What happened with your unit when they came flooding over? Well, we we were uh, further north of our division, I believe, and uh, it was King Company, and I was a platoon leader at that time, and. Uh, the night of uh, the 24th of September, 1950, uh, the Chinese came down in mass and uh, never seen so many Chinese soldiers. But uh, they said there was about a regiment that hit us that night, 
but I think it was about three three regiments. Um, and uh, my platoon was in the lower part of this mountain with the rest of the company, other than there was another platoon right with me near my platoon. And uh, uh, we fought all night off and on. And the next morning, early in the morning, before it got light, I sent a soldier up to contact the company. And he came. He was there for quite a while, and he, this was a black soldier. And he came down disguised as a Korean with a Korean hat and a white coat. And he said, Sir, there ain't nobody up there but Chinamen. And the company had been hit and they scattered. I believe the company commander was captured for a while, but then they he got away later. So we held them off for till about noon the next day and uh, I ran out of ammunition and I was the only one firing at the time, so my assistant platoon sergeant was there with me. And I told him it was time for us to surrender. And he said, well, he was going to play dead. And I said, okay, good luck. <laughs> and I stood up with my hands up and a machine gun fired at me uh, from the behind. So I got back down in my foxhole and waited a few minutes and Finally, I just decided that that was it. So I threw my weapon out and stood up again, and for it seemed like about a minute, nothing happened, and then the Chinese started rushing out of this uh, ravine. And uh, I su was surprised. Most of them patted me on the back and were very happy to see me captured. Uh, there were a couple of them that weren't happy about it, and they gave me a little a couple of hits with a bit with the rifle butts but anyway that's uh, when I got captured wow. so what did they do to you then did they make you do a forced march they well first they uh, they moved me up with some other prisoners who had been captured and I was the only one left in my platoon the assistant platoon sergeant uh, I saw him later, and he w he had been captured also, but he died during his captivity. So I'm the only one from my platoon to come back. So the one who played dead, that didn't work? No. no. He was captured and died later in a prisoner of war camp. And they they recognized that I was a an officer, and they sort of separated me from everybody else. And for a while, I was by myself. They moved me out of there for a couple of miles south of there. And then other soldiers, captured soldiers, uh, began coming in with me. Then uh, after a few days, uh, more and more prisoners came in, most of the, and they separated the officers from the enlisted men. And there were about, uh, I'd say about 20 officers in, in my group. But uh, I found out later that the entire 2nd Division had been cut off during that action. And uh, a lot of them were captured. In fact, there were about 2,000 of us uh, POWs at that time. The first few days, we were separated, and then other people started coming in. And they moved us to some caves. And we were in these caves about uh, two weeks and we'd get one meal a day. 
but at least the caves were a little bit warmer than it was on the outside. And after that, uh, they moved the whole group. I think there were about 2,000 of us by that time. Hmm. We went west over a big mountain range, and uh, the weather was uh, below zero, well below zero. I think it was the coldest winter that they'd had in uh, North Korea. At uh, Pyeongtong, it was designated Camp 5, uh, POW Camp 5, and uh, many, many of the prisoners were congregated there. They were still, uh, there was still inadequate food. Uh, the weather was still below zero, and uh, people still dying. Uh, every day you'd find, you'd see people that had been moved out, and the Chinese would come along and collect the bodies. But fortunately, uh, I survived all of that. And after a f few weeks, they began uh, their indoc indoctrination program. They were trying to indoctrinate us into their uh, communist theories and trying to convert us, I guess, into so that we'd be communists when we got out of there. But uh, we, uh, we have resisted that. And finally, we just went along with them so they wouldn't uh, harass us too much. And we'd go to, uh, we'd have classes every day, and a Chinese officer or individual would get up and speak in Chinese for about 15 minutes, and then an interpreter would tell us what he said for about five minutes. And then in the afternoon, we would go back to our little huts and... Uh, we were supposed to discuss what we had heard that morning, what we had learned that morning, take notes. And I was selected to be uh, the monitor for my hut, my room. In other words, my job was to sort of supervise the discussion. Well, we discussed uh, the food we were going to eat when we got out of there. And I would designate somebody every day to take notes, not about what we were talking about, but what the Chinese had told us that morning, and quotes from everybody in the room. And uh, we had one man appointed to be a lookout, and if the Chinese... Uh, were approaching, he'd let us know, and we'd all start talking about what we'd learned in the morning. <laughs> and uh, as soon as they left, we'd start talking about what kind of food we we're going to have when we got out of there. <laughs> and that went on for several months. Finally, when it started getting warmer, the Chinese furnished us with uh, uniforms, lightweight uniforms, and for the summer. Things began to get better then in the springtime, and uh, fewer people were dying at that time. What was the toughest part for you? I mean, all, all, all of it is horrible. The indoctrination, I'm sure the beatings at times, the, the malnutrition, the, the sickness. What, what well, I, did you struggle with? I think with? it was just the malnutrition that... Uh, I became very weak. Uh, originally, when we'd go out on a wood run, we'd pick up wood to bring back to burn to keep the stoves going, to cook the food and so forth. And I could carry a fair-sized log. But then, as time went on, I could just pick up a little stick and barely carry it along, carry it back to... So all of us were, with a few exceptions, were uh, extremely weak. 
And then as the food got a little better, we started uh, putting on a little weight. I think uh, when I was captured, I weighed about 150 pounds. And at one time, they somebody got hold of one of these uh, levers that you weigh by, and we figured that I weighed about 85 pounds at that time. 85 pounds. And all of us were in the same, basically the same condition. But then when the when things got a little bit organized for the Chinese, we started getting better food, and uh, it was all uh, what we called koliang, which was a a grain. We never got any meat, and occasionally we'd get a, a little fish in our diet, but not very often. One of the reasons you're here, in addition to sharing your own very important story, is to honor Father Emil Capon. Um, how did you first meet him, and what was his impact on you? The first day that we arrived at Camp 5, uh, the first evening, uh, we they'd broken us down into groups, and uh, we had about 25 people in one small room. And uh, as uh, right after dark, there was a knock on the door, and we told whoever it was to come in, and he said, uh, Good evening, I'm Father Capone, uh, 8th Cavalry Regiment, and welcome to Camp 5. And he said, uh, would anybody like to pray? And of course, everybody wanted to pray, wanted to pray. But Father Capone, after that, he would come about once a week and pray with us and tell us uh, jokes that he had heard and cheer us up, try to cheer us up. And uh, he'd do that about once or twice a week. And he was going around to everybody in that camp. In the, at dark, he would sneak under the barbed wire and go into the enlisted group, uh, enlisted compound, and do the same for them. He'd cheer us up and try to cheer us up and uh, and give us a little spiritual help. Uh, so I would see him, uh, well, a couple of nights a week maybe. And then uh, in the daytime during the classes, uh, he was required to attend also during the daytime. And uh, that's the way we got to know him. Finally, uh, we heard that he had died or he was getting... We knew he was getting very sick, and he was, what he was doing was giving his food up to sick people and taking care of them, and uh, he actually made a bowl so that he could boil water to drink and then to wash clothes for the sick people. And uh, finally it uh, got to him and he, uh, he passed away. What was the impact on you personally from his selflessness oh, as well as the unit even after he died? We were all uh, heartbroken that we, when we learned that he had passed on. But uh, at least he kept us going for through the winter or most of the winter and uh, remembering him helped keep us going for the rest of the time there what was it like in terms of wondering if you were going to be freed or if the war was going to end soon well the rumors were spreading that the war was over that the there was a 
hospital ship down at the end of the river and they and uh, they were going to come up and take us down there at any minute now and but it went on and on and on so finally we we got so we didn't believe anything when you realized you finally were going to be free what was that like well um the Chinese were going to make a big deal out of that, that. and we all decided by that time we the officers had moved to another camp, camp number two, which was about uh, 15 miles away from the camp five, and we decided that we were not going to show any emotion at all, so they, they lined us up and they had cameras there and everything and they were expecting a big cheers and everything and they told us that the war was that the armistice had been signed and that we were going to go home and there was complete silence <laughs> so we didn't give them the opportunity to to let us cheer that, that we were going home and then uh Oh, it was about two weeks later. They said that the, that we were going to pack up, and uh, a convoy of trucks pulled up, and we loaded all of our stuff, got on the trucks, and we sat there and waited. And after about an hour waiting in the trucks, uh, they came back and said. There's been a storm, and the road had been washed out, and so we weren't going to go that day. So we went back to our hooches, and uh, uh, the next day they loaded us back on the trucks, and we went on up to the railhead and got on train and came back. I've heard from other folks who were prisoners of war that just before the release, they fed you much better cleaned you up some, so it looked like they had treated you better, correct? Oh, yes. When when the armistice was signed, they they broke, broke out all this food that they'd been hoarding, canned meat and canned food from Argentina and uh, all this wonderful stuff, candy. And uh, we gorged ourselves with that, and then uh, when that ran out... Uh, we starved again for a little while on the way home. But uh, we got on the train and came all the way down to Pamanjan, where the exchange was. And there they put us in another POW camp that was very rudimentary, uh, sleeping on the ground in tents. And... Uh, they about starved us to get death again down there before we were released. And they would release a couple of, come in and read off a bunch of names and we'd get in, they'd get in the trucks and go down and be released. And uh, about halfway through, I guess, uh, they called my name and I was released. When When you've been without freedom for more than two years. What's it like to have it back? Well, it was wonderful. <laughs> uh, I, we could hardly believe it. Uh, they took all our clothes and gave us GI uniforms, and it was really wonderful. To, and the first thing we had was a bowl of ice cream that we hadn't had for almost three years. That had to taste great. I've, I've heard that there was also a, a special cross made in honor of Father Capon that was carried out. Is that? Oh, yes. Uh, a Jewish officer uh, who arrived at our camp after Father Capone had passed away uh, heard so much about Father Capon that he... Uh, uh, he made a, a knife out of the steel plate that in the bottom of our uh, shoes. He found an old shoe, got the steel plate out of it, sharpened it up, 
made a knife and he carved a cross using uh, some of the ba- uh, baling wire and made this wonderful cl- cross that was about oh, three feet high, I think. And af- this was after Father Capone had died. The, the Jewish officer uh, never met Father Capone, but he'd heard so much about him that he made the cross. They kept it hidden for hidden for uh, almost two years, and uh, then when we got released, they carried it out. When you see the difference now between North Korea and South Korea, what do you think? Oh, it's uh, wonderful. When we were when we were released, when I came back from. Uh, from Japan after being wounded, I went through the capital of uh, of North Korea, Pyongyang, mm-hmm. and uh, there was it, the city was operating. It was the streetcars were moving and so forth, and uh, there had been some damage, but you couldn't really see it. When we came back through on the way home. Uh, there was nothing there but rubble. And a lot of the rubble had been cleared away and they'd planted uh, uh, fields, made fields there and planted garden where there used to be buildings. And you look up on the mountainside all the way around on the hills around the town and the people were living up, up there. The only thing in... The city was one bridge across the river, and that could not support the tra- the, tra- the train. So we had to get off the train, get into trucks. They took us across the river. We got on another train there and went back down to Penman John. Uh, we only have a couple minutes left, but as I mentioned, you also served in, in Vietnam. What was your role there? Uh, I had two tours in Vietnam. The first tour, I was uh, an advisor to the uh, Vietnamese Infantry School, a tactical advisor. And then uh, the second tour, I had come back and uh, was sent to Fort Hood, and I became a battalion commander there. And uh, right after I took over as a battalion commander. The regiment uh, was formed, and my battalion <clears throat> was part of the 198th Infantry Regiment. So we, uh, the 198th was designated to go to, back to, uh, to uh, Vietnam. And we moved back there, and I commanded the the regiment for about uh, six months in combat there around July. How intense was that? Um, July was not, there was not too much action there. There was a lot of, uh, of um, Vietnamese, Viet Cong uh, within the, but uh, the North re- North uh, Vietnamese army was scarce around there. So, uh, but our mission was to uh, primary mission was to prevent the Viet Cong from rocketing the the division headquarters. And how long were you there? Two tours, you said. Each about yeah. a year. Yes. When did you retire from the service? Um, I retired in 1974, I think it was, and uh, went to back to New Mexico. To uh, my wife's sisters, two two of her sisters, lived in the small town of Hillsboro, New Mexico, and that's where we moved and. Sh- stayed there until uh, the year 2000. Me, then we moved back to Las Cruces. There's a great story that from the end of the Korean War where you lost a bet 
in the best way possible because someone said that you were going to go home because you had been exchanging letters with your wife and they said you'd be married within a certain amount of time, right? That's right. Where'd you hear that story? Oh, I do my research. <laughs> <laughs> yes, a friend of mine, uh, when we were still prisoners, uh, told me, I'll bet I, I got a letter from Virginia, my wife, and, or my future wife. And uh, he said, I'll bet you a fifth of whiskey that uh, you get married within six months of when we get back. And I said, oh, I don't have any plans to do that. And uh, within a, two months, we got married. <laughs> <laughs> so I lost a fifth of whiskey, and I finally, we got stationed near... Uh, San Francisco, and uh, I looked the guy up that he was stationed there, and I paid off his fifth of whiskey. Good man. Best bet you ever lost, right? So I hold that against my wife all from, <laughs> for the last 65 years or so. I think that's a good she, bet to lose. She cost me a fifth of whiskey. <laughs> Fantastic. Love to end on that note. Paul, thank you very much for your service and thank you for your time with us today. Thank you very much. Paul Roach is a graduate of West Point. He is a U.S. Army veteran, served in Korea and Vietnam. I'm Greg Corumbus. This is Veterans Chronicles.